The value of my eternity begins here today. I've done a little Bible study here and there this morning. I swam my little bit of, of yardage, 3,000 yards. But most importantly, now I'm getting focused on doing my YouTubes and then continuing in my study for 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Actually, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Yeah. I'm finishing up chapter 2. I did chapter 1. And now I'm doing the YouTube on answering the questions that have so much controversy about Acts chapter 2, verse 38 especially. People jump right to that verse, forget reading anything before that. Now we're reading after that. We're already jumped up to Acts chapter 13. How does that corroborate Acts chapter 2, verse 38? I'm glad you asked. Acts 13.13, 13. now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia, and John, John Mark, the author of the Gospel Mark, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in, in Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the Law and the Prophets, as they go as want in the synagogue, the rulers of the synagogue sent to them, saying, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Acts chapter thirteen sixteen. Then Paul stood up and has had an opportunity to speak, as we should take notice of that. When you have an opportunity to speak, preparation is important beforehand. Now get ready and stand up with courage and boldly say what God leads you to say. Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. Note that Paul addressed the people at a meeting in the synagogue at Antioch. They consisted primarily of Jews, whom he stipulated as men of Israel. Furthermore, he included in his opening address those that fear God, evidently Gentiles, who were also there at the synagogue service. Paul's address began with a short history of how the God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. From Egypt, Paul recounted the 40 years of the people of Israel in the wilderness. Does it sound like somebody in Acts chapter 7? Stephen, yes. A great methodology here. Build up to the gospel. And the battle for the land of Canaan and, after, and the 150 years of the rule of the judges until Samuel the prophet and thereafter Saul, the first king of Israel, <clears throat> giving him a history lesson. And then Paul continued with King David, a man after God's own heart. And finally, wow, here we go. The arrival of Jesus, the Savior of Israel, through the seed of David. Acts 13, 17. So we jumped. We started at Acts 13, 16. We jumped. The God of this people, Israel, chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he brought them out of it. Now for a time of about 40 years, he put up with this, their ways in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed the land to them by allotment. After that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Jer Benjamin, for 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up for them David as king to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who will do all my will. From this man's, David's, seed, according to the promise, God raised up for Israel a Savior, Paul goes on to write and say, Jesus, after John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel, a little good history lesson here. Paul declared that before the coming of Jesus Christ in his humanity, his perfect humanity, to fulfill his mission to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, Acts 13, 26-39, we have John the Baptist preached the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. He preached to Israel uh, of national repentance. There it is, national repentance, Acts chapter 2, remember, and then postponed. They didn't go through natural repentance, but he preached it, and Paul, 
uh, acknowledge that for a forgiveness of sins through a moment of faith alone in the Christ, the Messiah alone, unto eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. Acts 13.39, whereupon each Israelite believer was to be water baptized by John, symbolizing the Israelite believer's identification with the appropriation of Christ's provision of forgiveness of sins, whereupon the eternal king kingdom of God would commence should all of the people of Israel repent and believe. Already, Acts chapter 13, complete corroboration, John the Baptist, Jesus after him, and then Peter in Acts chapter 2. Here we go, Acts 13, 25, and as John was finishing his course, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not he, John the Baptist, but behold, there he comes the one after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to loose. John the Baptist is talking here, and he's talking, looking forward to Jesus. Men and brethren, Paul says, sons of the family of Abraham, and those among you who fear God, to you the word of this salvation has been sent. For those who dwell in Jerusalem and their rulers, because they did not know him, nor even the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. And when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in the tomb. But God raised him from the dead, right to Jesus. He was seen for many days by those who, by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who were witnesses to the people. And we declare to you good news, the gospel, that promise which may, was made to the fathers. The good news, Paul declared, was that promise which was made to the fathers of the people of Israel of a Messiah Savior, which Paul stipulated was fulfilled, fulfilled in Jesus of forgiveness of sins unto eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God through faith in his atoning sacrifice, verse 39. Acts 13:33, God has fulfilled this for us in their, uh, us their children in that he has raised up Jesus as also it is recorded in the second Psalm, you are my son today, I have begotten you. In any case, Look at this, Acts chapter 13, Paul reiterates what Stephen did in Acts chapter 7, and go back in the earlier chapters, Acts chapter 5 and 4 and 3 and 2, where Peter gives the message uh, of what Jesus, who Jesus is and who they crucified, and gets right to that point. Now Paul is saying exactly the same things. Jesus, you'll be given forgiveness through faith alone. doesn't say water baptism here, and it's very particular. So we have a complete corroboration. So in Acts 13, 33, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. The phrase, you are my son, in Psalm 2.7 comes from the Davidic Covenant, 2 Samuel 7.14. It is appropriated in Psalm 2 to show the legitimate God-ordained right of the king to rule. <clears throat> the phrase, today I have begotten you, refers to the day of one being anointed, chosen by God, to be king of Israel. The day of the coronation of the king and his adoption as a son of God, a son of God, into the family of God, into an eternal life, familiar relationship with God. So the king of Israel was born again. But in the case of ancient Israel, in that particular dispensation, different from the church, they still had the promise of eternal life because Christ wouldn't have come until the first century. It is implied that the anointed king of Israel, being declared to be a son of God, has the reception of eternal life, and will receive an eternal kingdom inheritance to rule the nations to the ends of the earth in the future eternal kingdom. Psalm 2.8. Don't mistake that. This also applies implies that the rebellion of the nations of the world toward the Lord and his anointed one will finally be put down. So, the phrase, you are my son, in, in Psalm 2.7, comes from the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel 7.14. It is appropriated in Psalm 2 to be show the legitimate God-ordained right of the king to rule. The phrase, today I have begotten you, refers to the day of one, an individual, individual being, being anointed, chosen by God, to be king of Israel. 
i.e. the day of the coronation of the king and his adoption as a son of God into, into the family of God. Now I say A. We write that, un, underscore that, and underline that. A son of God, not the son of God, into the family of God, into an eternal life, familial relationship with God. It is implied that the anointed king of Israel, being declared to be a son of God, has a reception of eternal life, and will receive an eternal kingdom inheritance to rule the nations to the ends of the earth in the future eternal kingdom. Psalm 2 a. This also implies that the rebellion of the nations of the world toward the Lord and his anointed will finally be put down. So David was one of the kings of Israel. So was Saul and others. They received this anointing. They were also saved by grace through faith. Different dispensation, promise looking forward to Christ's sacrifice for sins beginning in the first century, centuries later, now we look back centuries ago. In view of the lack of complete fulfillment of the prophecies in verses 1 through 9, through King David or any king after him so far, the context must jump out of the time of David to a future king of Israel, the anointed one, the Christ, from the Greek, Christos who will inherit the nations of the world and the ends of the earth evidently as an eternal inheritance and possession. Psalm 2 a. We're looking for a king of, of Israel who will fulfill that. Actually, I'm thinking of Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. That one particular one, son of Israel, born of, of Israel, son of, of Israel, Lamb of God. So the future anointed of God, the Christ, will meet the enraged nations, peoples, kings and rulers of the world in conflict and break them with a rod of iron and a dash and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel, despite the warning of the Lord through the psalmist in verses 10 through 12. So it jumps in history to one who fulfills this. Now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you will you perish in that way, in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Notice that individuals throughout the world are blessed when they put their trust in the anointed one of the Lord, the Christ. This anointed one, remember, anointed one is Christos in the Greek, Hamashiach in the Hebrew. And the look, the specific anointed one, which is stipulated here in Psalm 2, is the one who's going to rule all the nations of the world. This anointed one is far more than a temporal king of Israel. For throughout the world, one may trust in him to be blessed. No temporal king can say or do that. Nor can the wrath of a king over all the nations of the earth be so powerful unless he is God himself. And Isaiah 9, 6-7, we look at that we find out he's both God and man. Taking a look at that in Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. All right, here we go. Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. We're going all the way forward in Acts. We go all the way back in Isaiah 9, chapter 9. We can also jump to 6 and 7. We won't, I mean, 9, uh, Isaiah 53. But well, let's just stick with Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. For uh, unto us a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Sounds like physical birth. And us is Israel. And the government will rest on his shoulders. Okay, he'll be king of Israel. Okay, well, that could be David. Well, yeah. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. Okay, we've gone beyond David. There will be no end to the increase of his government of, or of peace beyond David. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. David was the king of Israel, born again, yes, looking forward to the promise being fulfilled in Christ on the first century, who's a descendant of David, 
tribe of Benjamin, wonderful counselor, my